Today on Aqua Kids. Come along with the Aqua Kids as they analyze the salt marsh, embark on a kayak expedition, and explore the diversity of Barnegat Bay. So, ready to make a difference? Building a better planet starts with you. Hey everyone at home, and welcome to another fantastic episode of Aqua Kids. I'm Drew. And I'm Katie. Today we have a very fun-filled show set in two very different ecosystems. That's right. From the marsh to the bay, we're going to be learning all about how climate change impacts both of these very different environments. Well, I can't wait any longer. Let's get started. The Aqua Kids started off their morning in the salt marsh, one of the most productive ecosystems in the world. But before we headed out, we need to grab a few tools to help out. So wetlands are really important, not only as a coastal habitat, wow. um, for, as a fisheries, but also in helping to keep our water clean. They act as kind of the kidneys and the lungs to oh, help cool. aerate. Um, huh. Straight out in front of you is Barnegat Bay. Um, we, wetlands are also really important in helping to protect the property and, and houses behind them. Looks like we're here. Yeah. So this is the area where we're going to um, use as our base camp in order to do our wetlands assessment and evaluation. So um, we're going to do some on land and then we're also going to get into the kayak. So we're going to go out and kind of look at the marsh edge and discuss a little bit about what's happening out into the marsh. So the work that the wetland scientists are doing in the state of New Jersey and primarily on Barnegat Bay, which is where we are right now, and Delaware Bay, is to really look at what's happening to our coastal wetlands. Um, so we do have to look at a number of things, chemical, biological, and also physical structure of the, of the wetlands itself, and also the shoreline edge because erosion is a big factor. Hmm. As sea level rises, it continues to inundate the marsh, cover the marsh, and then also has erosional forces that we're really concerned about. Uh, in Barnegat Bay, for example, on average over the last 10 years, we've lost almost 50 feet of shoreline, meaning it's retreating wow. inward. And as sea level rises, it will also impact the, the communities that are behind us. So it's really important, um, not only from a habitat standpoint, which you talked a little bit on the way out, but also from protecting human health. So what are we going to do first? So first we're going to take a soil sample, which means we're going to take a soil core. You're going to take the auger and you're basically going to turn it and screw it into the ground. All right. This is tall. It's bigger it than is you, tall. Katie. It is bigger than me. Need a uh, hand? Maybe. <laughs> It's a good sign yeah. when the auger doesn't go in really quickly, it means there's a lot of root mass, and roots right. are really important in helping to hold the wetlands together. No, I don't do it. Give it a, <laughs> give it a good push okay. or pull. Okay, now you can do it. <laughs> and just keep twisting. There you go. Okay, now I can finish. Look at what I did. Wow. There you go. <laughs> good. Good. Okay, so now we're to the top of the, the top of the auger. Give it a pull out. All right. And make, oh no. That's nah, a little bit easier than you think. Oh yeah, it is. Ooh. Okay. Nice. So now <laughs> crazy. Whoa, let's let's bring it up and let's take a look at what's going on in the marsh. So you have your, your top layer where all your plants are, and um, th this is important. We need to know where the root where the root mass ends because that tells us how thick the mat is and it also is an indicator of how healthy the wetlands are. Oh. So here what you can see is that the roots come down to here but then they also travel, we have more roots that go all the way down to the end. Oh yeah. Because the, we haven't driven the auger all the way down to the ends of the depths, in order to find out really how far the roots go down, mm -hmm. we would take another, we take a spade shovel, dig the hole a little bigger and then stick our arm all the way down oh, wow. until we can't, well, we can't feel any more root mass. So what does this tell us about the marsh? So it tells us a, a number of things. One, it tells us how much um, detritus, things that are breaking down, um, which is healthy for a wetland in order to ha allow the wetland to keep pace. It also hmm. tells us if we have a really consolidated root mass that goes down far, it also tells us, it's another way of telling us that the marsh is very stable, which is oh. a very important thing. And why this is important also, um, we take the soil cores and we actually run them and look at carbon and carbon dating. Hmm. We can tell a number of things about sequestration, which is the marsh actually absorbs 
um, carbon and nitrogen from the air, which is really important when it comes oh, to wow. greenhouse gases. Just set that aside. Okay, now what I want you to do is go down on your knees and reach that arm in and, and kind of feel until you don't feel any more roots. You may have to look kind of. Just keep feeling. Yep. <laughs> so or to the point where you really don't feel any more roots, like little threads and strings, it's just kind of mucky. Sure. Okay, let's bring your arm out. And when you bring it out, just bring it straight out. And then <laughs> and bring it up, you can come on up. And then what we need to do is I need to take a measurement of that. So I'm gonna grab our meter stick and then we're gonna take a measurement. Cool. Yeah. And then we look at the top of his line to the top of his fingertips. So we're at about 29.5. And that information will record in there. But if you see this, this is really nice muck. Yeah. It's got a lot of, um, uh, organic materials it also has a little bit of clay when you see it doing this that means there's like a lot of clay if it was really like not clay and it, it would just kind of fall apart in your hands it's like putty. what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the marsh stability the, the platform of the marsh and how stable it is so we're going to take this measuring stick which also serves as the platform for our slide hammer and if you notice down low it's been marked off so that we can easily measure and we can read it out in the field so the next thing we're going to do is you're going to pick up the slide hammer right. and we're going to set the top right on top. You're going to keep down. Yep. And you're going to keep one hand on top okay. and then you're just going to let the slide hammer fall without so just let it go. Good. Nice. So now what do you do is you take a reading. So it hasn't probably moved a whole lot. Not at all. So what do we uh, want to see here? Well, if the marsh is really stable, you're not going to see much movement at all. If it was really mucky, it, you could end up having it go down 5, 10 centimeters at a time. So that's the third time, mm -hmm. and we see, still see no movement. Maybe a centimeter. And one more time. All right, go ahead. Great. Good. Two and a half. And we had about two and a half. In some areas in the marsh, if you sat it down, um, the first time you hit it, it would probably drop, drop five and then even more. And if we went into this mucky, the mosquito dish, ditch behind you and we did the exact same thing, you would, you would, it, it would probably meet the top line. Jeez. All right, so we're going to test the water quality. So first thing we do is we need to drop the probes down into the water. And you want to spin it around because we don't have a ton of water flow here. So we need to make sure that the water is flowing over the probes. So when you look on the screen, you can see the numbers are changing. Oh, they are. So the ones that we're the most interested in are temperature, um, the dissolved oxygen, uh, the salinity, and the pH. So what do these numbers mean? So right here, you see the salinity is kind of low. Um, that's because we're in an estuary. So an ocean water would be at like 33 parts per thousand. Mm -hmm. Right here, we're about um, we're at about 28, so we are pretty close to the mouth of the, the bay. So what does all this tell us? So we can look at long-term trends to see how the marshes are changing. Um, so if we can notice that the marshes are getting more and more, uh, having a higher and higher salinity, then we can see that there's more seawater inundation as opposed to water coming, fresh water coming off of the shore. If we see that the pH is changing, that might change the different species that we'll find in the marsh. Um, in temperature, we can also see trends in temperature to see if sea level, uh, if sea temperatures are changing. So it's really looking at long-term trends as opposed to looking at a specific snapshot. I never knew you could get so much information from roots in a salt marsh. That's right, Katie. Although I had to get a little dirty, it was great to see that this marsh was in stable condition. Don't go away. Aqua Kids will be right back. Aqua Kids presents another Aqua Kids pop quiz. Barnegat Bay is known for its diverse ecosystem. Do you know how many miles of shoreline the bay covers? Is it A, 13 miles, B, 42 miles, or C, 26 miles? I'll be back with the answer after the break. Did you guess how many miles of shoreline Barnegat Bay covers? The answer is C, 42 miles. This bay starts at Point Pleasant Canal and runs south to Little Lake Harbor. Barnegat Bay's ecological productivity and broad appeal make this coastal area one of the most valuable living resources in the nation. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. Now we're headed out on kayaks to get a closer look at the marsh. Okay, let's go. All right, Aqua Kids, the best way to see the marsh is from the water. So we're gonna go take some kayaks out and see what we can find. All right. All right, All right. so to put them in, lift up the handle and just slide them into the water. Can we jump in? Yeah. 
Hold on to the side as you step in. Oh boy. You got it? I think so. All right, guys, head off towards the right side. All right. As we come around this corner, you're gonna to wanna to stay to the left because on the right side, you'll see there's an old cedar road. It's all these cedar logs that are stuck in the water because this whole area used to be farmed um, for salt hay. Hmm. Now, Erin, what can we expect to find out here? So you'll see a lot of different kinds of wildlife. Wetlands are really good habitat for migratory birds. So you'll see things like ibises and egrets, lots of seagulls, some terns. So why is this estuary important to the ecosystem? Well, so the estuary has two main functions. For one thing, it um, filters out lots of new uh, things that we don't want in our water system. Um, it filters out heavy metals and nutrients from runoff and farmlands. It keeps sediment from land from running into the water and into the bay um, where it meet, it the sediment would make it so that life in the bay would have a harder time of living. So it acts basically as a kidney for the ocean system. So how is sea level rising impacting the wetland environment? Well, so as the sea level rise, more, of, more and more of the marsh is getting inundated at high tide, which means that the trees at the edge of the marsh, you can see back there, they're yep. starting to die because they're getting salt water as opposed to fresh water. Oh. Um, also, you're starting to see more erosion of the marshes with sea level rise. And erosion is a big problem in Barnegat Bay. We're losing about three feet of our marshes every year. Wow. Um, and that pro causes problems for people's houses and things like that. After Hurricane Sandy, we definitely noticed that there was a lot of erosion going on. Um, and had some of the marshes been more intact and some of the dune systems been more intact, maybe the effects wouldn't have been as bad. Now, are most of the causes of erosion natural, or can they be caused by human actions as well? It's a little bit of both. As we're seeing sea level rise, that's obviously one of the causes, and that's a combination of uh, impacts from climate change. But also, you get erosion from people driving their um, personal watercrafts close to the wetlands, and you get big wakes there. Yep. Um, you also just, there's natural erosion that happens as well. It's a, it is a natural process. It's just, it seems that humans are speeding it up by uh, developing the land behind the wetlands, which means that there's less sediment delivery. Right. And by things like driving, driving boats near the wetlands and um, dredging projects as well. Is there anything that humans can do to help reverse the effects of development and help to preserve this ecosystem? Well, so one of the big things is looking at water conservation. Um, water is a precious resource and we want to make sure that we're not withdrawing too much um, from the water table before it comes in. So, you know, taking shorter showers, not, mow, uh, not watering your lawn excessively, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Also, preventing your, uh, lots of nutrients from coming in by excess fertilizer, things like that. And also looking at development, so trying not to build on marshes and trying to preserve them and the areas that they're in. So it's really important to protect these marshes because they protect our bays and they protect our houses further back. Right. Um, it's also a great habitat and it's lots of fun to come out here kayaking. Aren't you guys having fun? I'm having, I'm having a, great a great time. time. Coming up next, sailing at Barnegat Bay. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. We're changing course a little bit and heading out into the Barnegat Bay to do some saining. All right. The Aqua Kids arrived at Barnegat Bay where they met up with scientists from the Barnegat Bay Partnership. Great. Let me tell you what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be saining here in the Barnegat Bay looking for juvenile fish and jellyfish to see how they've changed over the course of the years that we've been doing this here. Follow in Tina's footsteps. That way we're not disturbing all of the animals and the fish that we're trying to catch. We're gonna start pulling this out. All right. We do this all summer, and we catch different uh, species of fish on different different periods as they move in and out of the estuary as they get older. Because um, we get a lot of juveniles that live out in the ocean come into the estuaries to breed, and then while they're small, they live here because there's a lot more hiding places and, and areas of protection for them. All right, so this hole's a little unusual in that we got a lot of grass in here, um, which we normally don't get at this location. 
But you can see we also got uh, a lot of crabs, um, a bunch of different kind of interesting fish. Is that a pipe fish? Yep, sure is. This is a oh, pipe cool. fish. They're related to seahorses. You can tell they've got a little paddle a little on the eel. Yeah. And then oh my God. Cool. we've also got an American eel here. What kind of crab is that? It looks like a yep. blue crab. It sure is. So this is a blue claw crab. And you can tell that this one's a male based on the yep. shape on the bottom there. Uh -huh. uh, it looks almost like the uh, Washington Monument. So that's, that's, that's right. a male. What kind of fish is that? So this one is a, a juvenile needlefish. You can see they look, a lot of people think that they're barracudas, but they're not. <laughs> uh, they're from a different family, and so they've got a really long body, and then that really long snout that actually does have a whole lot of teeth in them. Yeah. Uh, and they can get a little bit bigger than this also, about a a uh, foot and a half, two feet. But yeah, they're, they're pretty neat fish, and, and we get them. Again, like most of these small fish, the reason we're looking at them is they come into the estuary here mm -hmm. uh, as early life history, little baby fish. Sure. And then they use the estuaries as a safe haven to feed and grow wow. and get bigger, and then most of them will head on out come the fall after spending you know the first six months of their life here until they get to be full size. Uh, this one, here. Oh, it's like a little... Fish. Little shrimp, it <laughs> sure is. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of our common shrimp here. So not the kind you'd eat. Uh, this is a paleomon. It's Very called. Clear. It's the genus. Yep, they're they're pretty clear. We actually have two native of these guys. So they they're supposed to be here in Barnegat Bay. Okay. And recently there have been some questions about whether we have some invasives that have come ah. over from Asia or Europe. Do the invasive species cause any problems for the, any of the wildlife that we found here? They absolutely can. They can outcompete some of our native fish for food or space. They also, because they're new to here, they don't necessarily have any predators. So that allows them to grow and reproduce faster than our ah. native fish do as well. What do you have there, Tina? All right, a summer flounder. Check this one out, Joe. Oh, look at this. Come on in. So this is a summer flounder, one of the two uh, main flounder species that we get here in the bay. This is also called a fluke. It's a big recreational fish wow. in the bay. People love to go fishing for these guys when they get bigger. The other one we get is called a winter flounder that we get here in the bay. And you can tell the difference between the two based on the size side of their head that the eyes are on. Hmm. You'll notice both eyes are on one side here. Correct. And so on the summer flounder, if his mouth opens up, that's all on his left side, the ah. eyes. The winter flounder, the eyes are going to be on the right hand side. Why is that? Uh, just one of the developmental uh, Interesting. neat things that go on in biology. All right. So this is a sea nettle. So this is uh, one of the species of concern here in Barnegat Bay recently. And I'll hold them up in a second, but give you guys a good look at them. So this is a stinging jellyfish. Mm -hmm. It's called the stinging sea nettle. And in Barnegat Bay, over the last 20 or so years, it seems like we've been getting more and more of these every wow. year. Hmm. Uh, if you talk to some of the old timers in the bay, They'll say that they would see them every once in a while, but starting in the mid to late 80s, all of a sudden they started seeing more and more. I and see them all them. over the place. Why is that? Uh, well, we're not entirely sure. We think there are four or five possible explanations. Uh, one could be with climate change. The temperature is getting a little bit warmer, so it's more conducive to them being here. Sure. Uh, also, salinity plays a factor. Uh, some folks think that it has to do with the bulkheading in the northern part uh, of the yep. bay. Oh. Be because the early life stage of a jellyfish, they don't just float, they actually have what's called a polyp. Think like a small coral reef. Coral. Oh. And so they need to attach onto something. And so there are a couple different reasons. One of the neat things about these guys though is because they're clear and you can see through them, the reason we put them on this whiteboard, if you look into the top, yeah, you, you can, can actually see in and you can tell that this one is actually a female. Because if you look into the bell here on the top, you can see that that, that milky white or kind of brown that's a female reproductive system. If it was a male, it would be hot pink in here, wow. almost like Pepto-Bismol color. Wow. <laughs> and so that's how you can tell. You guys found some cool things out in the bay. We sure did. It was great to learn about all of the different species found in the bay. Don't go too far. Aqua Kids will be back in a minute. Here's our top story. New Yorkers realize importance of coastal wetlands. Not only is New York City home to one of the most diverse human populations, but it is also home to 26 distinct and diverse natural habitats. And one of these habitats, the coastal wetland, is becoming increasingly important to New York City, since it acts as a buffer able to absorb flood water and storm surge. 
Not only are wetlands able to absorb some of the force from strong waves, but they are also able to take in water from heavy rainfall, preventing sewers from overflowing. The benefits of coastal wetlands to New York City are endless, but unfortunately, only 20 to 25% of the original wetlands remain. If NYC wants to continue reaping the benefits of coastal wetlands, residents need to make any and all efforts possible to prevent their further demise. I'm Katie with Aqua News, keeping you connected to our planet. Now back to Aqua Kids. Well, it looks like we're out of time for today's show, but we sure were busy. From learning all about the functions of the salt marsh to sailing in the Barnegat Bay, we sure learned a lot about two different ecosystems. While both seem to be pretty stable, this may not always be the case. Doing things like conserving water or refraining from spraying fertilizer on your lawn can help prevent any damage to these environments. That's right, Katie. We always have to remember that everyone can do their part to help keep our planet green and blue. And so can you. So visit our website to follow us on our journey. And learn how you can come along with us. So together, we can keep the world and the water a great place to play and explore. And we'll see you next time on, on Aqua, Aqua Kids. Kids.